What drives someone to ruthlessly take the lives of two charismatic and compassionate people who represented a beacon of trust and values in the community? This is the troubling tale of the double homicide of Yves Beluardo and Martin Chide. Eve, 66, renowned for his intellect and acting, and his partner Martin, 57, a symbol of elegance and kindness, were stalwarts in Le Mans, a city globally recognized for its historic architecture. Once a tranquil sanctuary, it turned into a horrifying scene of tragedy as their lives were prematurely ended, shocking the nation. Let's venture back to that dreadful day. The morning of November 27, 2004, started as any other in the quiet town. As the sun rose and the town began to stir, a neighbor on a morning walk noticed a broken window at Eve's and Martine's residence. When the police finally arrived, they found a scene far more terrifying behind the shattered glass. In the upstairs bedroom, Eve lay lifeless beside the bed. After more investigation, it was found that he had been shot twice in the arm and stabbed 11 times. Martine met a similar fate. Hidden behind the bedroom door, her body was discovered curled up with 13 stab wounds from what detectives identified as a hunting type of knife. This brutal act of violence left a chilling shadow over the once peaceful town. But the question remains, who could commit such a heinous crime? And for what reason? With no witnesses, no security footage, no murder weapons, and only a couple of unidentified footprints at the crime scene, the investigators had little evidence to work with. The burglary gone wrong theory was quickly discarded. The culprit, or culprits, seemed to have entered through the broken window and headed straight upstairs to commit the unthinkable. As days passed, missteps in the investigation started piling up until a new revelation emerged. Martine had been having an affair with a colleague. Could this gruesome double homicide be a crime of passion? But after questioning, his alibi was solid. He wasn't even in Le Mans on the dreadful day. In the midst of this horrific crime, Martine's daughter Julie desperately fought for the truth. But as the case saw numerous changes, handed over between six different investigators due to its complexity, and the initial investigator dismissed due to medical issues in 2009, her hopes began to dwindle. The once peaceful life these two community pillars shared was brutally extinguished, leaving behind a baffling mystery that still confounds investigators. Despite nearly two decades passing, the case remains open, with occasional progress, but a conclusive breakthrough still out of reach vertical door transition. The circumstances of their termination are as spine-curdling as they are puzzling. Each individual met a brutal end, their existence snuffed out in what would become one of the most perplexing mysteries of the region. The town, snuggled in the bosom of France, was a haven where security and tranquility were commonplace. Yet, in the hub of this peace, a tempest was gathering, one that would indelibly tarnish the town with the imprint of a ruthless slaying. The character of this crime was distinctive, not just in its savagery, but also in the enigma that enveloped it. Despite comprehensive investigations, the perpetrator remains at large, a specter hiding in the city's shadows. And so, the veil descended on the existences of Eve and Martine, leaving behind a spine-chilling puzzle that continues to baffle detectives even now. Vertical door transition. The chilling double homicide of Eve Beluardo and Martin Scheid in Le Mans 2004 was a baffling mystery that challenged French law enforcement. Initially, the probe held promise but was quickly stifled by a series of unfortunate missteps. The investigators in charge proved inadequate, committing errors and missing crucial leads, turning the investigation into a rudderless vessel. Adding to the disarray was a significant rotation in magistrates. Over the course of the investigation, the case was transferred an astonishing six times, leading to discontinuity and stagnation. Each new magistrate brought their own methods and assumptions, often disregarding the previous work. The initial investigator, esteemed for his methodical approach, was unfortunately dismissed in 2009 due to medical issues, adding another layer of complexity to the case. This constant upheaval left the investigation perpetually on the drawing board, and the case became a convoluted puzzle with most pieces missing. Despite relentless efforts, the team could only uncover a few leads, most of which turned out to be dead ends. Martine's daughter, Julie Chide, and the rest of the victim's family wallowed in despair. They held a glimmer of hope that the case would be handed over to a more competent team. But the double murder remains an unresolved mystery, highlighting the flaws of the French criminal justice system. 
The hope now lies in the specialized unit's innovative approach and resources to unveil new leads and ensure justice for the victims. The case found a new direction when it was moved to the National Unit in Nanterre, a hub for unsolved mysteries. This transfer represented a last-ditch effort to make progress in the stagnant investigation of Yves Beluardo and Martine Chide's unsolved murders. The case, having been stalled for two decades due to various obstacles, was brimming with dead ends and diminishing chances for justice. Finally, Julie Chide took a stand for action. Her insistence on justice for her mother's untimely death led to the case's relocation to Nanterre. She saw potential in a fresh perspective that could breathe new life into the stale investigation. The National Unit wasn't just any other investigative unit, but a powerhouse of seasoned investigators who had received over 200 unresolved cases. Their expertise and determination are highly respected. Now under their stewardship, the hope was that their fresh outlook and ample resources would unearth previously overlooked leads. This wasn't just a change in venue, it was a powerful statement that the pursuit of justice for Belwardo and Chide was far from over. Their memory would not be consigned to the forgotten files of unsolved cases. Now in the hands of the National Unit, a new dawn of hope arose, illuminating the shadowy labyrinth of this unsolved mystery. The Unsolved Mysteries Division in Nanterre, a ray of optimism for numerous unresolved cases, now possesses the solution to deciphering the enigma of the double murder. This national division, ensconced in the cradle of France, is a haven for conundrums that have been cloaked in doubt and desolation for too long. They are an amalgamation of exceptional investigators, forensic connoisseurs, and experienced detectives, all equipped with state-of-the-art technology and an intertwined ardor for justice. They are the final hope for victims' kin who have endured years and possibly decades in their quest for closure. This division has the distinctive competency to invigorate stagnant cases. They methodically scrutinize heaps of evidence, re-inspect obsolete leads, and ceaselessly hunt for new ones. Their weaponry comprises avant-garde forensic implements and methods that can reveal verities concealed for years. In the past, the division has triumphantly concluded more than 40 of the 200 cases they received. Each of these triumphs not only delivered justice to the victims but also served as a stark affirmation that no case is ever genuinely cold. Every resolved case is a tribute to their persistence and dedication, inspiring those still hoping for their turn. In the instance of the Le Mans double murder, the potential of incorporating specialized sleuths emits a hopeful glimmer. They plunge into the maze of hints, tirelessly sifting through the details, in pursuit of that elusive clue that could steer them to the solution. Almost two decades on, the unsolved double murder of Eves and Martine still haunts Le Mans, bringing distress to their families and the community. But hopefully, with Julie's determination for justice and the case being transferred to the specialized unit in Nanterre, they will finally find the answers, the closure, and the justice that is well-deserved. In the core of central France, July 21st, 1946, a horrifying revelation disrupts the peace of the rural landscape. The serene calm of the summer day was abruptly shattered, replaced by an indescribable terror that forever imprinted its mark on the peaceful farming community. This is the chronicle of the Carteron murders, a chilling narration that still remains shrouded in mystery. Now imagine a family of tireless peasant farmers living in semi-isolation. Kleber Carteron, his wife Alphonsine, their son André, and Claude Godard, a state ward, were the embodiment of rural serenity their existence deeply entwined with the rhythms of the land they worked. Their nearest neighbor, miles away, would only discern something gravely wrong four days later on July 25th. The crime scene presented a horrifying spectacle of raw brutality. The Carteron family was discovered bound and savagely slain in their own abode, the victims of a crime whose motive remains inscrutable even today. The murder instrument? A Sten submachine gun, a detail that was initially ignored amidst the turmoil of the preliminary investigations. In the wake of World War II, France was a country wrestling with the remnants of strife and societal instability. This unrest is reflected in the diverse conjectures that sprung up surrounding the motive of the Carteron homicides. Was it a personal grudge? A savage act of retribution? Or could it be linked to the French resistance? a gloomy reflection of the recent war's violent repercussions. In 1948, a sliver of hope appeared as a suspect armed with a Sten gun was identified. However, like the fleeting shadows of a passing cloud, it quickly dissipated, leaving behind more questions than answers. 
the investigation went cold, the enigma deepened, and the spine-chilling account of the Carteron family murders remained an unresolved puzzle. As we delve deeper into this unresolved crime, brace yourself for a spine-chilling journey into the abyss. Within the gore-streaked confines of the Carteron farmstead, a horrifying tableau awaited the law enforcement. The silence that blanketed the secluded farmhouse located in the rural heartland of France was a haunting forewarning of the macabre scene that had unfolded. The Carteron family, regular farmers renowned for their peaceful yet rebellious nature, had been subjected to an unexpected and terrifying massacre. Kleber, his wife Alphonsine, their son André, along with Claude Godard, the farm's ward, were not just killed, they were executed. The family's homestead, once a testament of their dedication and hard work, had been metamorphosed into a grotesque display of violence and indiscretion. The four victims, who were finally found after a locksmith was able to break into the room, were bound at the wrists and ankles, face down, with a life-shattering bullet hole embedded in the back of each of their heads. This bore the unmistakable mark of an execution, their corpses defaced by the brutal submachine gun fire, their bindings hinting at a degree of premeditation that chilled the bone. Yet, amidst the savagery, the lack of motive left the authorities dumbfounded. The Carterons were unassuming, industrious people, far removed from the convoluted intricacies of city life. Their quiet existence offered no hint of scandal, no evidence of a personal grudge, no telltale signs of a botched robbery. The baffling absence of motive, coupled with the presence of a military-grade armament and anomaly in the tranquil rural surroundings, left investigators grappling with more questions than answers. Who could bear such ill will towards this humble farming family? What could drive them to perpetrate such a heinous act? And where was the pivotal clue that would bring this horrific crime into perspective? The investigation unraveled a complicated tapestry of unanswered queries. With the murder instrument missing and the motive obscure, the Carteron homicides were a conundrum begging to be deciphered. As detectives commenced assembling the fragments of this macabre act, they were confronted with more dilemmas than solutions. The Carteron family, humble toilers of the fertile French fields, were savagely slain within their own homestead, a barbaric act that reverberated throughout the serene French landscapes. The early stages of the investigation were fraught with obstacles. The investigators faced hurdles due to the seemingly irrational nature of the act and the absence of a clear incentive. There was no visible motive, no straightforward explanation for the brutality visited upon the Carterons. This led to the scrutiny of two primary hypotheses, each with their own captivating convolutions. One hypothesis centered on a personal vendetta. Was there a concealed grudge against the Carterons? Was there a sinister mystery concealed within the rural hills that the family had stumbled upon? Regardless of their rigorous exploration into the family's history and connections, no tangible leads sprouted from this line of questioning. Another hypothesis connected the harrowing act to French resistance. The weapon of destruction, a Sten submachine gun, was a common tool of warfare utilized by the resistance during the Second World War. Was it possible that the Carterons had been entangled in some post-war repercussions, casualties of a strife much greater than their existence? But this line of questioning, too, met a dead end. A ray of hope sparked when the belongings of the victims were unearthed in a neighboring woodland. This fresh evidence led to the pinpointing of a suspect in 1948, two years after the gruesome murders. The suspect was apprehended with a Sten gun, identical to the one used in the homicides. However, the probe into the suspect remained inconclusive. Despite their relentless efforts, the case remained cloaked in mystery, a symbol of the tumultuous post-war society. The Carteron murders, a terrifying act that decimated a family and stunned a community, remained unsolved. The initial investigation stymied by the societal turbulence of post-World War II France failed to deliver the much-needed closure that the Carterons and their community ardently sought. In the aftermath of inconclusive investigations, various hypotheses have endeavored to illuminate the incentives behind these horrifying executions. The Carteron homicides, a savage display of violence against a family of diligent farmers, continue to cast an ominous shadow over the community, compelling us to come to terms with the unknown. Among these hypotheses, the personal conflict theory has garnered substantial attention. This theory posits a violent clash stemming from concealed disputes within the Carteron clan, 
a family living in seclusion. The theory, albeit speculative, provides us with a potential motive, a desperate requirement when trying to make sense of such mindless savagery. It is, however, vital to understand the backdrop against which this probe was conducted. The year was 1946, a period during which France was still recovering from the traumatic aftermath of World War II. The societal instability, coupled with a scarcity of comprehensive forensic technology, crafted the ideal environment for an investigation laden with challenges. It's noteworthy that the initial inability to even determine the type of weapon used, a Sten submachine gun, reflects the magnitude of the hurdles faced by investigators. The other theory, one linking the crime to the French resistance, was also considered. The Sten gun's association with the resistance sparked questions about a potential linkage. However, much like the personal conflict theory, this hypothesis too reached a stalemate, leaving us with more puzzles than solutions. And finally, in 1948, a potential suspect was apprehended, armed with a Sten submachine gun and potentially connected to the crime scene. Nevertheless, this lead, akin to those that preceded it, fell short of definitively cracking the case. The persistent theories, while enticing, are yet to provide an irrefutable explanation. Over seven decades later, the Carteron homicides continue to plague the chronicles of true crime history. The savage extermination of the Carteron family, a group of industrious farmers, remains one of the most horrifying unresolved mysteries in central France. The case continues to provoke endless debates, discussions, and even literary works among those captivated by the dark side of human nature. A peaceful school journey in the charming town of saint brevin le pin abruptly becomes a dreadful incident when the young and quiet Jonathan Coulomb inexplicably disappears. The year was 2004 when the calm seaside town of saint brevin le pin was thrown into a nightmarish chaos. A group of school children, including the reserved Jonathan Coulomb, were on a leisurely excursion enjoying the sun and the charming landscape. Jonathan was a shy child, often lost in his own thoughts, far removed from the playful chatter of his classmates. His sudden and unexplained absence was all the more alarming. The terrifying reality of a missing child, a nightmare every parent dreads, was now faced by Jonathan's parents and the entire town. As the news of Jonathan's disappearance spread, the town was engulfed in a wave of panic and bewilderment. The local law enforcement was promptly alerted and the desperate search for Jonathan commenced. The once peaceful town, earlier filled with the delightful laughter of children, was now reverberating with the distressed cries of a frantic search party. The school journey, originally planned for fun and friendship, had taken an unimaginable turn. The charming landscape was transformed into a terrifying backdrop for a real-life horror story. The town was in a state of emergency, the usually calm streets now buzzing with the quick steps of search parties and the anxious murmurs of the locals. As dusk fell on that ill-fated day, the hope of finding Jonathan began to dissolve into the encroaching darkness. The town that had begun the day to the excited chatter of schoolchildren was now consumed by an unnerving silence, occasionally broken by the haunting calls of Jonathan's name. Jonathan Coulomb, a timid child on a school journey, now a name permanently engraved in the annals of true crime. Jonathan's destiny, once an enigma hidden in the shadows, soon unveils itself in the most terrifying manner one could imagine. This ten-year-old boy, by nature reserved and quiet, disappeared during what was thought to be a harmless school excursion, only to be found later in a deeply horrifying state. Jonathan's lifeless body emerged from the still waters of a peaceful pond in Garande, in an unspeakable manner that was in stark contrast to the serenity of the location. He was not simply drowned, but was bound and weighed down by a cinder block, becoming a terrifying symbol of the malevolence behind his end. The discovery of his body sent shockwaves rippling across the community, a bone-chilling wake-up call about the fragility of innocence and the lurking perils in our world. The once peaceful pond had transformed overnight, its calm surface forever tarnished by the ghastly act that unfolded within its depths. The haunting image of Jonathan, restrained and submerged, turned into a horrifying symbol of a crime that rocked the nation to its core, illustrating the disturbing capacity for evil that hides in the shadows of humanity. The unearthing of Jonathan's body signaled the commencement of a heart-wrenching saga, a narrative of suffering and justice that was set to unravel in the coming years. The terrifying discovery prompted an immediate and comprehensive investigation, with a multitude of questions clouding the air like a dense mist. Who could possibly commit such an atrocious act 
What sort of creature would prey on a child? The search for the truth became a united cry for a community in grief, a nation in disbelief, and a world grappling with the horrific tragedy. As the reality sunk in, a chilling sense of dread spread, the realization that a predator was on the loose. The gruesome unveiling of Jonathan's body marked not just a tragic end, but the beginning. The onset of an unwavering pursuit to bring the monster responsible for this unimaginable crime to justice. A serene pond in Garande had morphed into a grim crime scene, concealing the horrifying secret of Jonathan's tragic demise. As the shock recedes, a relentless pursuit for justice emerges. The journey to reveal the truth about the unfortunate demise of young Jonathan Coulomb begins. Our investigators, experienced yet rattled by the gruesome nature of this crime, initially zeroed in on a local predator as a potential suspect. This assumption was not without basis. Those who blend in with the familiar often hide the darkest secrets. However, the intricacy of the crime and its calculated execution presents multiple hurdles in the investigation. Jonathan had been abducted during a school trip to a camping ground. With the door to his cabin missing an interior knob which forced it to stay open and the nearby fence having a well-known gap in its links, the hypothesis of a local menace seemed all too obvious. When his body was later found, tied with a nylon cord at the neck, wrists and ankle, attached to a cinder block in a garande pond, a new theory arose. Could this unthinkable crime be linked to others? The intricately planned method of the crime and a scarcity of solid evidence led to an intricate maze of suspects, only leading to more questions than answers. As each day passed, the increasing public demand for a resolution served as a recurring reminder of the justice that remained out of reach. Despite the horrifying nature of the crime and the lack of concrete proof, the investigation team remained resolute the silent plea of a lost child echoing in their hearts. The initial probes, while thorough, failed to bring Jonathan's murderer to justice. The pursuit for truth, though slowed, was not extinguished. Inside every investigator, the fight for justice continued to burn a beacon of hope in the darkest of nights. Years roll by, but the quest for answers remains undimmed. Then, an unforeseen admission flips the case. Enter Martin Ney, a German serial killer with a spine-chilling record. Known to the world as the Masked Man, this figure of horror was no stranger to the inside of a prison cell. Yet it was within these cold, grim walls that Ney would make an admission that would flip the investigation of Jonathan Coulomb's murder on its head. Ney, driven by guilt or perhaps a perverse sense of arrogance, confesses to the murder of Jonathan Coulomb. This startling confession brought French prosecutors into action, indicting Ney for the unresolved crime and thrusting the case back into the spotlight. It's worth mentioning that Ney's name has also been linked with other high-profile disappearances, like that of Madeleine McCann, thereby adding even more layers to these ongoing investigations. Martin Ney, a name now linked with childhood horrors, becomes the prime suspect in the tragic murder of Jonathan Coulomb. As we delve deeper into this chilling tale, one thing remains clear. The quest for justice, no matter how many years roll by, always burns bright. With Ney's admission, the tragic tale of Jonathan Coulomb finds its grim resolution. The repercussion of this horrifying acknowledgement was swift, reverberating through the society and the legal framework. Ney, infamous for his dreadful deeds, found himself facing new indictments for the atrocious crimes he'd enacted. Martin Ney, cloaked his identity behind facades and terrified the blameless, was no stranger to the icy, unyielding confines of a jail cell. This time, however, he was confronting the possibility of a trial in France, a country marked by his trail of sorrow and loss. French prosecutors, fortified with Ney's shocking admission, tirelessly geared up for the trial. The case of Jonathan Coulomb, a timid child whose life had been mercilessly extinguished, became a beacon in the fight for justice, a fight against the darkness that had claimed too many innocent lives. Yet, even as justice progressed, the specter of Ney's atrocities loomed, the memory of Jonathan, a life tragically cut short, served as a stark reminder of the malevolence that walks among us, even as justice draws nearer. On the dawn of May 6, 1986, Fontainebleau, France, a horrifying spectacle unravels. Within the serene calm of a Parisian suburb, cozily nestled in the heart of France, a startling disclosure so unsettling, so alarming, was poised to fracture the unity of this close-knit community. In the subterranean depths of a typical residential block, a horrific revelation awaited. A life barely lived, snuffed out in a savage manner. 
It was the lifeless body of Cecile Bloch, a guileless 11-year-old girl. Her body was marked by the harrowing imprints of a ruthless and atrocious crime. The brutal evidence of violence marred her unblemished form. Her suffering had been immense, the physical proof palpable and irrefutable. Evidence of violation, asphyxiation, and stabbing. Each element was more terrifying than the previous, sketching a bone-chilling portrait of her prematurely truncated life. This grim discovery sent seismic shocks through the tranquil neighborhood. Comrades, residents, and strangers alike wrestled with a grisly reality that seemed too monstrous to be true. The sanctity and safety of their homes, their community, had been defiled in an unimaginable way. The basement, previously just an unremarkable component of their daily existence, now bore the indelible mark of a horrific crime, a savage conclusion to a life brimming with potential. The tranquility of the community was supplanted by an icy terror, a looming apprehension that permeated the atmosphere. The atrocious crime had not just robbed a young girl of her life, but it had also purloined the peace and innocence of the entire neighborhood. The inconceivable had transpired right in their community, right under their unsuspecting gaze, in a place they once warmly referred to as home. As the news disseminated, the tight-knit town found itself in turmoil. The ghastly crime scene depicted a scenario so austere, so shocking, that it was nearly impossible to fathom. A youthful existence ended, a family fragmented, a community eternally marked. As the news radiated, a tide of terror seized the town. The pursuit of the beast was underway. Law enforcement sprung into action, flooding the residential complex where young Cecile Bloch's existence had been ruthlessly extinguished. The basement, once a space synonymous with storage and discarded objects, morphed into a bone-chilling crime scene. The comprehensive inquiry was stringent, with officers leaving no stone unturned. They meticulously scoured the building, gathered criminological data, and interrogated potential eyewitnesses. The township was aghast, with the terror tangible. Parents clung to their offspring tighter, and the usually convivial streets of Fontainebleau fell into a sinister silence. Despite the police's fortitude, the clues were sparse. Even with the DNA found at the crime scene, no suspects in the database matched. The transgression was savage, the evidence convoluted, this criminal puzzle demanded a precise methodology, with each fragment of evidence undergoing rigorous scrutiny. Yet the beast's identity who had enacted this atrocious crime remained hidden. Law enforcement toiled relentlessly, their frustration amplifying with each sun that set. This was more than a case, it was a crusade. They bore the burden of the community's dread and sorrow and it invigorated their resolve. They utilized every resource possible, even extending their reach to other jurisdictions for aid. The community, too, was vigorously engaged. They hosted candlelight vigils, disseminated awareness, and contributed in any possible way to the investigation. The essence of solidarity was potent, but so was the undertow of terror. They yearned for justice for Cecile and safety for their kids. Years elapsed, and the zeal of the initial investigation steadily diminished. Emerging cases demanded attention. Yet, for law enforcement, the case of Cecile Block was never relegated to oblivion. It was a lesion that refused to mend, a riddle clamoring for resolution. Yet despite their utmost exertions, the case eventually turned cold, leaving a persistent feeling of dread. Unbeknownst to them, the beast was nearer than they anticipated. Welcome to the eerie tale of Francois Verove, far from the commonplace closeted boogeyman, but a former gendarme and officer of the law. The paradox bites deeply, a guardian turned hunter. Verove's tale serves as a petrifying memento that wickedness doesn't always dwell in the societal abyss, but, disconcertingly, parades amongst us under the noon sun. His narrative doesn't culminate with young Cecile Bloch's horrific demise. In fact, it merely signaled the commencement of a terrifying tale that unfolded over a year. In 1987, merely one year after Cecile's murder, the Grim Reaper visited again, claiming two adult lives. Unfortunate beings who found themselves ensnared in the path of a man, bereft of any semblance of humanity, a man who seemingly evaporated, leaving the authorities in disarray and a community captive to fear. Verov's crimes weren't confined to homicide. His reign of dread encompassed sexual assaults and mutilation, etching a permanent scar on his victims' lives. His violent rampage was punctuated by a chilling hiatus, a void teeming with unresolved enigmas and unsolved cases. The community existed under the specter of an unidentified beast, their dread intensifying with each day. 
Each sunrise brought with it the apprehension of potential horrors soon to be unveiled. Each sunset marked a sigh of relief, signaling another day survived. Yet the beast was there, concealed amidst the community. A man who had once pledged to protect and serve had instead inflicted harm and wreaked havoc. His victims, people who trusted him, were instead betrayed in the most gruesome ways. Thus the beast continued to loom in the shadows, forging a path of destruction in his wake. Three and a half decades elapsed. Then a bombshell struck, causing seismic ripples through the community. The explosion, a farewell letter, was composed by Francois Verove, an erstwhile law enforcement officer. This was far from a conventional goodbye to the world, but a startling admission, a bone-chilling acknowledgement of guilt that would shake the community to its very foundations. In the letter, Verove admitted to the slaying of Cécile Bloch, the young girl of 11 whose existence was savagely snuffed out in her apartment building's basement back in the year 1986. The community was left staggering. The offender, a man who had once donned the uniform and was entrusted with the duty of safeguarding the harmless, was the beast had dreaded all along. But the disclosures didn't halt there. Verov's admission wasn't solely confined to Cecile's murder. The letter associated him with other nefarious deeds, sketching a portrait of a man who led a dual existence, a guardian on one side and a predator on the other. As though the written admission wasn't enough, science intervened to substantiate the startling acknowledgement. DNA evidence, the silent witness found at Cecile's and other scenes, unequivocally connected Verov. It was a match, a fragment of the puzzle that had escaped the grasp of investigators for more than 30 years, now fitting perfectly into place. The consternation and terror that swept the community was tangible. The truth was a hard pill to digest. The realization that a protector could transform into a predator was a severe reminder of the dichotomy of human nature. A man who should have been a beacon of security had instead cast an extensive, malevolent shadow over the community. The community was left wrestling with this agonizing truth. The magnitude of this disclosure was unequivocally cataclysmic. A country found itself wrestling with a terrifying truth. A former guardian of justice, Francois Verov, was a ruthless predator, hidden within the very establishment designed to safeguard them. France, a nation soaked in history and tradition, was abruptly thrust into a grim reality. The narrative of Cécile Bloch, the 11-year-old girl whose existence was cruelly extinguished, became a haunting tale reverberating through all cities' homes and hearts. Discussions at dinner tables, in cafes, and on the streets veered towards this shocking disclosure, evoking feelings of fury, sorrow, and profound disquiet. The community in particular was staggered. The memory of Cécile, once a vivid part of their lives, was now corrupted with the gruesome details of her premature end. The very weave of their confidence was ripped asunder, replaced with a persistent dread and a frantic pursuit of justice. However, justice is a multifaceted enigma, and in this case, the fragments were strewn over three decades. The admission of Verov, while offering some resolution, also unleashed a Pandora's box of queries. How many more victims were there? How long had he been operating unnoticed? Could any measures have been taken to preempt these atrocities? The hunt for truth was not only a pursuit of justice, but also a pathway towards healing. It was a united endeavor to reclaim the narrative, to remember Cecile and Verov's other victims, not just for the nightmares they endured, but for the lives they led. It was an effort to illuminate the murky corners, to ensure that such beasts could no longer be concealed in clear view. The case of Cecile Bloch serves as a frightening memento of the beasts that can lurk amongst us, Yet it also stands as a testament to the resilience of a community, a nation that refuses to let these beasts skulk in the darkness. This story is far from concluded, and the quest for justice and truth persists. In the serene town of Rodet, on a chilling night in 1817, a French magistrate met a macabre demise. In the dawn, the existence of Antoine Bernardin Fualdez, a respected arbiter of law, was brutally extinguished leaving behind an enigma that would ignite countrywide discussions and motivate literary titans. Born into nobility in 1761, Fualdes acquired a legal education that would mold his destiny and, ultimately, his demise. He served as a defense advocate during the tempestuous era of the Revolution of France, a period characterized by vehement political turmoil and swift power transitions. His participation in this critical epoch was noteworthy. 
but it was his assassination that would carve his name into the chronicles of history. The circumstances surrounding his demise were enveloped in secrecy, whispers, and intrigue. The night was as obscure as the motives behind his assassination. The atmosphere was dense with suspense, and the haunting quietude was pierced only by the distant melodies of an organ grinder. His existence was claimed in the dead of night, his body abandoned as a grave testament to the violence that unfolded. The assassination of Fualdis was neither a crime of passion nor a result of a minor skirmish. It bore a political undertone, hinting at a conspiracy stretching well beyond the tranquil town of Rodez. The royalists, those craving the re-establishment of the monarchy, were the primary suspects. But reality remained elusive, and the distinctions between guilt and innocence were hazy. The subsequent events of the murder were as sensational as the investigation itself. The press coverage was fervent, the testimonies bizarre, and the trial a spectacle in its own right. This was not merely an assassination, it marked the onset of a nationwide controversy that would vigorously shake the foundation of French society. Thus commences the narrative of the enigmatic assassination of Antoine Bernardin Fouald, a story that persists in enthralling, bewildering, and inspiring even today. The probe into Fualdes's murder was far from conventional. As we delve into the archives, the oddities of this case commenced to surface like a tangled thriller. The life of the French magistrate was abruptly ended and the road to justice was far from linear. Envision the setting, Rodez, 1817, a town seized by the shock of a high-profile assassination. Fualdes' body was found floating in the river. When his waterlogged body was pulled to land, they discovered that his throat had been cut and his blood drained. The royalists stood as the main suspects, their motives as unclear as the Aveyron River's depths. However, as the investigation unfolded, it rapidly became clear that this was more than a mere political rivalry. Enter the strange depositions, each one seemingly outdoing the last in sheer extravagance, concocting a spicy brew of conjecture and gossip. One alleged to have heard the eerie melody of an organ grinder on the murder night. Another swore they saw a goat performing acrobatics in the street. A third was certain they spotted a spectral figure lurking in the shadows. There was even a deposition about a mysterious woman in white, her involvement in the crime as elusive as her identity. Now one might ponder, surely these depositions were disregarded as mere whimsical inventions. But no, in the vortex of this inquiry, these quirky accounts were considered with utmost seriousness, stoking the already ignited press hysteria. The press relished in it, magnifying every bit of gossip and supposition. The case turned into a national obsession, a blend of reality, semi-truths, and blatant lies. Each new disclosure, no matter how extravagant, was eagerly consumed by a public starved for answers and fascination. As the probe navigated its way through the maze of the strange, differentiating fact from fiction became increasingly challenging. Theories proliferated, suspects cycled in and out, but the truth of Fuldus's murder remained as elusive as ever. Fact or fiction, the depositions added layers of fascination to the already complex case. The affair Fuldus was not solely about the quest for justice for a slain man, it was a spectacle, a captivating drama that held an entire nation spellbound, and it was only the beginning. As the court proceedings began, the nation was collectively holding its breath. The stage was prepared for a legal showdown that would reverberate through the chronicles of French history. With over 300 witnesses to take the stand on both sides of the trial, the court transformed into a theater that performed a spectacle for the media that has permeated over the centuries. Antoine Bernardin Fualde's murder case was not just a pursuit of justice. It was an exercise in mental combat, a clash of ideologies, and a stress test of the French judiciary. The spotlight zeroed in on the defendants, assumed royalists, who stood in the dock under the scrutiny of the national gaze. The environment in the courtroom was a pressure cooker of tension, the atmosphere laden with expectation. One witness, the wife of a colonel, testified that her husband had witnessed the entire crime and said that Fualdes had been kidnapped in the street and then murdered in a small room. Pinned to a table, they slit his throat and drained his blood to be fed to a pig. But why would anyone take such gruesome actions? One witness said on the stand that he saw Fualdes leaving his hotel with what appeared to be a bulge under his coat. Were the contents of that bulge the reason such a horrific crime occurred? The stakes were astronomical. This was not just about the life of a man, 
It was about political motives, about the very framework of French society. The court proceedings were a spectacle, akin to a theatrical performance overflowing with unusual affidavits that kept the nation on edge. Witnesses ascended the stand, their voices reverberating through the courtroom, narrating tales that were both peculiar and eerie. The press, capitalizing on the hype, crafted vivid stories that held the public spellbound. The courtroom drama transcended being a case. It was an event that had the nation in its grip. The judgment, when it finally arrived, was a climax in this symphony of justice. Sentences were declared, and the defendants were held accountable for their purported crime. However, the actual culprit of the heinous murder was never truly believed to be justfully accounted for. Several trials emerged in the aftermath, slinging accusations at everyone and everything, convoluting the truth beyond recognition. These trials and appeals created echoes of the proceedings extended beyond the courtroom. The repercussions were felt nationwide, molding the political topography of France. The court proceedings of Antoine Bernardin Fouald became a seminal instance in French judicial history. It was a validation of the law's power, a tribute to the pursuit of justice. It demonstrated the court's ability to hold even the mighty answerable. Yet the court proceedings were more than just a legal process. They were a catalyst, a spark that triggered debate and discussion. It defied the norm, spurring society to question, reflect, and grow. The proceedings metamorphosed into a symbol, a beacon of justice and a of society. While justice was dispensed, the proceedings left a profound imprint on the French judiciary and society. They were a tribute to the durability of the law, a homage to the pursuit of truth, and a testament to a nation's unity in its quest for justice. The reverberations of Affaire Fualdas persistently resound in the chronicles of French history. This homicide case, imbued with enigma and political subterfuge, has etched an enduring legacy not only on the jurisprudential terrain, but also in the sphere of literature and public dialogue. Originating from an aristocratic lineage in 1761, Antoine Bernardin Fualdes played the role of a defense attorney during the French Revolution. His untimely demise in 1817 in the city of Rodez incited sensationalized court proceedings that held the nation's attention. However, it was the aftermath, the ripple effects, of the Affaire Fualdes that genuinely carved out its historical significance. Eminent authors like Balzac, Flaubert, and Hugo unearthed inspiration in the intricacies of this case. Their literary masterpieces introduced the Affaire Fualdes to a broader audience, transforming the narrative into a legend that surpassed the confines of time and geography. Through their eloquent phrasing, the case continues to fuel the imagination, triggering ongoing conjectures and debates about the circumstances surrounding Fualdes' demise. Yet, the ramifications of the Affaire Fualdes permeate far beyond the literary domain. It functioned as a propellant for a nationwide political contention, a dialogue unveiling the underlying friction between the royalists and the revolutionaries between antiquity and innovation. The case also imparted a significant imprint on French society. It underscored the influence of media and the public's unquenchable thirst for scandalous affairs. The peculiar testimonies, the outrageous allegations, and the theatrical court proceedings all served as grist for the media mill transforming the Affaire Fouald into the first significant media-documented homicide trial in France. Today, the Affaire Fualdes is revered not merely as a homicide case, but as a socio-cultural phenomenon that steered the trajectory of French culture. It stands as a testament to the perpetual magnetism of a compelling tale, a narrative that persists to enchant, to mystify, and to bewilder. The saga of Antoine Bernardin Fualdes transcends the standard parameters of a mere homicide. It's a narrative deeply interwoven into the tapestry of French history, an account rife with politics, dominance, and subterfuge, extending beyond the simplistic boundaries of a crime zone. It's a spine-chilling story originating with an otherworldly homicide in the tranquil town of Rodez and escalating into a nationwide sensation, contentious litigation, and a lasting legacy that continues to fuel literature and provoke discussions. Antoine Bernardin Fualde, the nobility-bred magistrate turned defense counsel represented more than an individual. He became an emblem. His homicide in 1817 served not just as a crime, but as a political declaration that resonated throughout France. Monarchists were implicated, extraordinary testimonies were recorded, and by 1818, verdicts were pronounced. Still, 
The aura of mystery around his demise never entirely dissipated. But what is the reason? Why does the affair fool this hold our attention even after over two centuries? Perhaps it's the magnetic pull of the unresolved, the puzzle that keeps us conjecturing. Or possibly it's the theatrical narrative filled with political subterfuge and sensational press reportage. Or maybe it's because his homicide was not just a crime. It served as a watershed, a pivotal point in history that underscored the discord and strife of post-revolutionary France. The Affaire Fouald was not merely about a man's demise. It spotlighted a nation wrestling with transformation, a society teetering on the edge of change, and a judicial structure under intense scrutiny. It was a story reflecting the intricacies of its era, a narrative that continues to reverberate even today. It stands as a powerful reminder of the potency of storytelling, the influence of media, and our enduring curiosity about the macabre and the inexplicable. Thus, we return to that eerie night in Rodez, to the perplexing homicide of Antoine Bernardin Fualdez, and the unanswered questions that persist. What transpired in reality? Who was genuinely accountable? And why does his story remain so enthralling? Ultimately, the Affair Fualdez stands as a tribute to a narrative that continues to intrigue, perplex, and captivate us, even after two centuries.